Meeting come to order. Today is Monday, May 21st, 2018. This is a regular city council meeting. Will you please rise for the national for the uh, Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> Unless somebody wants to sing it. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Council will stand for a moment of silence. You're welcome to join us if you'd like. Thank you. You may be seated. Item one on the agenda is a joint public hearing with the Planning Commission. Mr. Chris Leonard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, two items in the public hearing today. We'll open the public hearing with a discussion on public comment on an ordinance to rezone tax map 644-00-00-001 from RUD in the county to R10 in the city as part of a 100% annexation petition. This uh, annexation petition and request to rezone uh, is a rezoning of 10 acres located on Gardendale Road. The applicant is to build a maximum of 18 single-family homes at an average price of $600,000 per home. The requested zoning is R10, which has a minimum lot of 10,000 square feet, an 80-foot lot width, 10-foot side setbacks, 25-foot front and 25-foot rear setbacks. The sketch plan for this development shows a typical lot size of 95 feet by 115 feet, which exceeds the development standards as outlined above. The streets within the development would be private, and each unit contained would be subject to the school and the city's forthcoming impact fee. Staff's recommendation is to approve this annexation and requested zoning, rezoning. Uh, with that, I guess I would open the floor to any public comment. Are there any comments pertaining to this request for annexation? Members of council. Anybody have questions here? Thank you. Planning commission members. We'll close that portion of the public comment period then. The second item in the public hearing uh, is an a, uh, ordinance to rezone tax map numbers 645-00-00-027 and 645-00-00-040 from RC1 in the county to R15 in the city as part of a 100% annexation petition. Uh, this request to rezone is, is, applies to approximately 8.7 acres along Vineyard Road as a residential subdivision R15. Total proposed residential density would be a maximum of three single family homes. R15 minimum lot standards are a 15,000 square foot lot size, 90 foot lot width, 10 foot side setbacks, 25 foot front and 25 foot rear setbacks. If annexed, this property would provide a road connection from River Falls to Vineyard Road, as this future road connection could help drive more people to the commercial areas in the city and as a minimal impact of the city and Fort Mill School District resources, staff has recommended approval of this annexation. I'll open the floor to any public comment on that annexation and rezoning petition. Members of council. Maybe, I mean, I, I went out there, I drove out there, I think it was Saturday, I couldn't find the place. <laughs> so from, from, obviously from the River Falls side, you can't get there. From the, uh, what's very the end of Vineyard Road. Right, so I would have just gone to the very end of the road to see that? Correct. All right. I went to the end of the road and I didn't see anything that I was looking for, so I was just, but I get it now. Could you elaborate a little bit on the, the through road, the connector you that's being discussed? Yeah, why don't Charlie, if you've okay. got the. In the uh, River Falls uh, preliminary plats, um, this would be probably phase three of River Falls once they get going. Um, we required them to leave a stub out um, that would actually, if you looking at the image that you have on the screen, it would be uh, to the right side of that image of, of what is outlined in red uh, towards the lower end uh, with a connection through road that would actually tie over into Vineyard. Uh, and as part of this process, uh, we're requiring them to preserve um, that, that access, that right of way across the property. Um, we've been advised by them that the larger portion uh, of the two, por uh, the two parcels uh, is to be subdivided 
so that gives you your total of three. You've got one existing now on the small parcel uh, to the north, uh, and then the larger portion would be divided uh, in half with uh, one dwelling unit each on those, um, but preserving the, uh, the access uh, so that as uh, River Falls uh, does reach that point, um, a, a connection road over to Vineyard is able to be uh, uh, installed. Okay, I get that. Um, and just for me, because, you know, it's three houses. It's not really going to impact our schools or our traffic. However, like, with the pro where's the process of River Falls at currently? I mean, it had, they moved dirt once a month just to maintain their <laughs> permits. And Correct. Uh, they, have to, they have to maintain the site, um, yeah, to keep, keep permits active and everything. Uh, they are still under preliminary plat, I believe, but they're uh, getting close to the sunset on, on that, um, uh, yeah, unless they, are, they, they move forward uh, to where they'd have to go back through the plat review process. The, the entitlements, as far as the zoning and everything, are still in place. Um, as to when they're going to move on that, I, I don't know. It didn't, we haven't received any indication as to um, they get real fired up with conversations, you know, hot and heavy, ready to roll, and then it kind of goes dark uh, for a few months. So um, I'm not sure when they're going to actually get moving on phase one. Okay, thanks. Who's responsible for the road from the stub in River Falls to Vineyard? Um, right now, it would either be the city or a future developer. Um, you know, the, the, the access would be protected. Um, it would be a conversation at that point in time whether there's some future developer that potentially comes in off a of vineyard um, and we require it of them, or if it stays, if the landscape stays as is, uh, and council um, at that point in time says, you know, we need to have this, then it would be something that the city would, would um, uh, have to fund if if there was absent somebody else. So how how far is it? Is it even a mile? Are we talking half a mile there? Or probably probably half a mile, mile, if that. At the most, I would think. Yeah. yeah. It's it's not a long stretch. I mean, keep in mind that the aerial imagery there is is zoomed out quite a bit. Um, yeah, it's it's maybe half mile um, from there to the end of uh, Vineyard Road. Um, there's also potential where we could reestablish the um, the public safety drive uh, at the end of Marsh Hen. Um, that existed, uh, it's still there, it's city-owned property, uh, that could, it used to connect to the end of Vineyard Road. Um, but we closed that off probably 15 years ago because we didn't serve over in that area from a public safety standpoint. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Turn it back to you, Chris. Okay, I think there was one uh, person from the... Uh, please, uh, if you would, come to the podium, and, uh, say your name and your address, just for the record. Thank you. Isabel Cordova, 16003 Molokai Drive. Now, I was just wondering what road the stub would ultimately connect Vineyard to. 160 or? I, I'm not. The River right Falls there. development that hasn't, uh, they, they started grading, it's across from the elementary school, uh, started grading uh, about three years ago and then stopped. They tore down that old house uh, yeah. just past City Hall. It would connect into the back end of that neighborhood, which would eventually lead out to 160. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, so it would hit Tiga K right about directly across from the elementary school. Correct, right across from the bus entrance. Yes. Right. With that, I guess we will close the public hearing. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, I'm going to use that, I guess. <clears throat> gotcha. We'll get somebody to dress me or something okay item number two special proclamations I'll come down there and do that Am I live? Sure, Am I live? Everybody we hear you. All right. Uh, Tim? Come here. Come here. I can't read very well. Tim Gillette is our tree man. We call him Tim the tree man. Now he's the operations man. 
get oh I'm not on that anymore. I'm on this. He's been with us for how many years now? Thirty years, sir. So you think about making it a career? <laughs> I think I did that already. He just today he comes off he comes off probation. We were putting him on probation to see if he was going to work out. <laughs> so as of tonight, congratulations. We're going to keep you. Thank you. Let me, just, let me just read what Tim does here. Tim came to TK after graduating with a forestry degree from Penn State. Wow. He started in 1988, the year I was born, <laughs> as first horticulturist. Hort hort horticulturist. Thank you. <laughs> Currently serves as operation director, but has also served as code enforcement officer. He is the city's safety and risk manager, and today marks his 30th year. So congratulations. Sure. And if you'd like to stay another 30. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, okay, now go to work. <laughs> Break time's over. Okay, on the agenda first. Uh, Eagle Scout, Benjamin Klish, would you step forward, please? How old are you now? I'm 17, sir. 17. So how long have you been an Eagle Scout? Uh, about four months. Four months. Normally, your highlight of your scouting career is the Eagle Scout. But he's went one step higher than that. He's now the Boy Scout of the Year for the State of South Carolina. So what comes after this? Mayor? <laughs> How old do you have to be to be mayor? 18. 18. Okay. I'll be looking for your campaign signs up pretty soon. <laughs> well, let me read this proclamation from the city of TAK. And since my eyes aren't as good as you, I will hold Whereas Benjamin Klish has, is that Klish or Klish? Whereas Benjamin Klish has been exemplary member of the Boy Scouts of America starting in 2006 as a Tiger Cub and a Boy Scout troop and with Boy Scout Troop 219, and where he currently is currently the Junior Assistant Scout Master, continuing to provide support, supervision, guidance, and whereas from 2014 to 2016, he was a member of the SEALs Scout Excited About Leadership Skills and attended the 2017 National Scout Jamboree, and whereas while the Eagle Scout Award is a distinction that will follow him throughout his life, so too will the honor of recently earning American Legion's Boy Scout of the Year. Whereas citizens of York County appreciate his hard work in removing the invasive Chinese privet plant species from a square acre of land at the Ann Springs Close Greenway in Fort Mill, South Carolina, over several days, which involved dozens of scouts, many adult volunteers, and amounting to over 170 miles 170 man hours. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the mayor and council of the city of TAK do hereby congratulate and recognize Benjamin Klish for his outstanding achievement toward the rank of Eagle Scout. We, prou we are proud to have him as a member of our community. Signed this 21st day of May 2018. Congratulations. That's quite an accomplishment. Thanks. I'll put this proclamation, take a picture here. Okay, well, we're not finished with you yet because we have the gentleman from the American Legion want to hand you something also. What's that, Commander? Oh, Jerry Marcus, please come forward. There you go. I know Jerry, by the way. He's a good guy. It's, it's wired. You're good. Ladies and gentlemen, Chairman of the Council and members, we thank you so much for inviting us to come here on this special occasion to honor Benjamin. Several months ago, we had the opportunity to post 250 Indian land to send forward the name of a special Eagle Scout to the state to be selected, hopefully, as the State Scout of the Year. And it is our great honor to 
commend you, congratulate you on being selected. He will go to Columbia uh, June the 1st to the State Convention of the American Legion to uh, receive his official American Legion award there. He is an exceptional young man in the state of South Carolina and you have so much to be proud of. I would also like for his mom and dad to stand up or come up also when they get their pictures because behind every Eagle Scout is a mom and dad who helps them forward. I want to mention one other thing if you don't know too much about scouting. Uh, you have to earn 21 merit badges to be an Eagle Scout and that's a substantial commitment to your life. This young man has gone beyond that. He has a, what's called a bronze palm and a gold palm. Each one requires five more merit badges. So he has 31 merit badges. That's not often seen in this day and time, so we commend you for that. We have several letters of, of commendation, and I'm going to read a couple of them. From the United States Senate, Senator Lindsey Graham sends this. <coughs> Congratulations on earning the distinction of Eagle Scout. You have joined an elite group of scouts who have also achieved this distinctive honor. You should be commended for your hard work, perseverance, and dedication. Those traits will serve you well in all future endeavors. endeavors. Once again, congratulations on achieving the rank of Eagle Scout, the Honorable Lindsey Graham, United States Senator. We have three certificates from state senators, Ronnie Crower, Chauncey Gregory, Ronnie Comer, and Chip Higgins, and they send, in recognition of your exemplary achievement in winning the American Legion Outstanding Boy Scout of the Year, this award is reflective of hard work and commitment. I truly commend your dedication and service. Thank you for your contributions to your community, your state, and the Boy Scouts of America. Best wishes for success in all of your endeavors as you continue to be guided by the laws of scouting. If, if the Kishes would please come up for a photo op. Congratulations on your achievement, and I look forward to you being a leader, not only in your community, your state, and your nation. These are all ex-boys. Thanks, sir. Ex-military. Do you mind going up and shaking everybody's hand up there? They want to congratulate you also. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, next we'd like to recognize uh, Eagle Scout Alexander Minnick and Guillermo Leon.
Come on up here. In fact, when you stand on each side of me if you want. Which one are you? Alex. Alex? And you must be Guillermo. Am I saying that right? Yep. <laughs> okay. So you're just newly minted, uh, so to speak, Eagle Scouts, right? How long have you been an Eagle Scout? Three weeks. And you? Uh, since February. Since February. Very good. Okay, here's a proclamation recognizing Eagle Scout projects by Minnick and Leon. Whereas Alec Minnick and Guillermo Leon have proven themselves to be outstanding members of the Boy Scouts of America, and whereas it takes many years of dedication and commitment to achieve Eagle rank, Eagle Scouts act as leaders, role models in the community, and the Eagle Scout Award is a distinction that will follow them through li throughout life and will be a beacon to others of their quality leadership and commitment these young men have shown. Therefore, be it proclaimed that the mayor and council of the city of TUK do hereby congratulate and recognize Alex, Alexander Minnick and Guillermo Leon for their achievements toward the rank of Eagle Scout. We are proud to have them as members of our community. Signed this 21st day of May, 2018. Where'd you go? Oh, am I just presenting these certificates? No proclamation? I got gotcha. you. Okay. So I've got, first is Cassidy Burns. Cassidy Burns, come on up. So you are being recognized. It's hereby bestowed upon Cassidy Burns in recognition of exemplary service of going above and beyond the extra mile. Is that correct? Yes. Good. So what did you do to earn the extra mile? Um, Okay. So with the city and community. Very good. You going to do any more of that? Hopefully, yeah. Okay, very good. <laughs> well, congratulations. Thank you. Get your picture here. Okay. Go back here. Oh, we got the same award for Nicholas Stalford. Come on up here, Nicholas. I can't wait to hear what you did. Congratulations. And what did you do to earn this distinction? I volunteered. For? The city of TUK. Do you, by doing what? Uh, like cutting roses. Put the mic on. <laughs> <laughs> speak up to the mic here. Uh, cutting roses in the fire department. Okay. Well, congratulations. Thank you very much for your service. <laughs> your picture? Thanks a lot. Okay, Adam D is the re recognition of Karen McKimmy and Cassidy Burns again. Yeah. Oh, you know I did. I forgot to give those kill coins to the kids. Oh well. You got this, sir. Yes, sir. All right. In uh, November of 2017, the uh, TGK Police Department started a new project that uh, included transparency, community service, crime forgot prevention, to give these coins to the kids. and crime reduction, all wrapped into one. Uh, this project is called the Take Two Program. Without the assistance of the Fort Mill Buzz, we would not be able to have launched this program. Thanks to Karen McKimmy for helping us launch this program and with the assistance of the students at Fort Mill High School. We wouldn't have been able to start what I believe to be the first program of its kind in law enforcement and what will become a new norm in crime fighting equipping citizens with real crime information and prevention tips to avoid becoming a victim. One person, Karn McKimmy, allowed this project to happen, but another person took this project and has made it a complete success. That person is Cassidy Burns. 
She's worked nights and weekends, and yes, she's even helped us on Sunday, this Sunday, uh, to do our last shoot. We can't thank them both enough, and I would like to present them both with the TGK Police Partnership and Achievement Award tonight for their extraordinary contributions. Thank you for your partnership in helping and aiding citizens with real information about crime and prevention in their community. Thank you very much. Right, we got to get a safe boating week proclamation. Once again. <laughs> we got any more with Cassidy Burns before I? <laughs> she could take the safe boating proclamation. All right. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Okay, item number E. Proclamation for safe boating week, which we will give to Chief Parker. Whereas on average 650 people die each year in boating related accidents in the U.S., approximately 80% of these fatalities are caused by drowning. The vast majority of these accidents are caused by human error and poor judgment and not by the boat, equipment, or environmental factors. Whereas a significant number of boaters who lose their lives by drowning each year would be alive today had they, been, had they worn their life jackets. Now, therefore, be, be, be it proclaimed, the mayor and council of the city of TK, South Carolina, that we support the goals of the Safe Boating Campaign and proclaim May 19th through 25th, 2018 as National Safe Boating Week and to urge those who boat to practice safe boating habits and to wear a life jacket at all times. Signed this 21st day of May, 2018. There you go. Thank you very much. Back to the podium, right? Or back to the day. So hold on a second. Okay, my exercise and reading. Is the mic still on? So I shouldn't say anything about Jack and Linda Stevenson. Oh, Linda. I was going to say nothing nice. We're now on, make sure this was on, item number 2F, resolution declaring May 6th to 12th as Municipal Clerks Week. Let's see, go through this. Go, Sylvia. <laughs> Yay, Sylvia, if I can find what I'm supposed to read. Got it. Are you kidding me? Anybody want to help me with this? Okay, here we go. Resolution declaring May 6 through 12, 2018 as Municipal Clerks Week in, this, in South Carolina and recognize and honor the valuable contributions that municipal clerks make to the cities and towns of South Carolina. And by the way, how many city clerks do we have? That would be... I'm sorry, in Antigua K. One, who would that be? <laughs> Sylvia Szymanski. <laughs> All right, here we go. Whereas the position of municipal clerk is the only municipal staff role that is required by state law, regardless of a municipality's, municipality size or form of government. All 271 cities and towns in the state are required to have a municipal clerk. Sylvia Szymanski plays a critical, <clears throat> a critical and varied role to support the mayor, city council, and city staff. Whereas municipal clerks' responsibilities under state law include giving notice of meetings to council members and the public, keeping minutes of the proceedings, and performing other duties. Regardless of the city size, municipal clerks have seen their roles and responsibilities expand with changing times. 
and municipal clerks get their professional training from the South Carolina Municipal Finance Officers, Clerks and Treasurers Association, an affiliate organization of the Municipal Association of South Carolina, celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. Whereas the South Carolina General Assembly has declared the week of May 6 through 12, 2018 as Municipal Clerks Week, therefore be it resolved by the City Council of the City of TK declares May 6 through 12, 2018 as Municipal Clerks Week in South Carolina to recognize and honor our valuable, the valuable contributions of Sylvia Samansky makes to our city, adopted on this 21st day of May, 2018. We don't get a speech out of that or anything? <laughs> All right. Uh, item number G, resolution supporting the Fort Mill School District Development Impact Fee. I'm very happy to do this one. The impact fee came back for the South Carolina, or for the uh, Fort Mill School District at 18,120, something like that, about like that. That's what we've been paying for each house that's coming to to the Fort Mill School District. We're subsidizing that. So I'm very supportive. Me personally, I, I, I'm sure I speak for the rest of us here, who've been being chewed up by all these uh, new houses coming in and all the costs that are borne by us. Borne by us. So um, I'm happy to read this resolution in support, and I hope the, for the uh, York County Council will uh, take into consideration that we are uh, supporting this resolution. So. Resolution supporting the Fort Mill School District development impact fee increase. Whereas the citizens residing with the jurisdictional limits of the city of TK are also residents of York County and part of Fort Mill School District, the city of TK strongly supports public education and recognizes the importance of public schools. The city of TK acknowledges the Fort Mill School District's success in building a reputation of providing outstanding academic opportunities for its students. The Fort Mill School District has experienced an unprecedented growth of its student population has recognized the need to improve current facilities and add new facilities to continue its tradition of academic excellence. Whereas the Fort Mill School Board has caused a capital improvement study to be performed as part of that study, a development impact fee was derived in order to have new growth within the district pay for its proportional share of these capital needs. The City of TAK supports the school district's objectives of continually approving improving facilities and upgrading technology to assist in properly preparing the future workforce remaining attractive to newcomers associated with new business moving to the area and addressing the contemporary needs of students, children of a well-educated community. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the mayor and city council of the city of TAK, South Carolina, in a meeting duly assembled, supports the Fort Mill School District's plan and implores York County Council to adopt the Fort Mill School District development impact fee in its full amount as proposed by the study to defray the, needed, the need for additional bond issues and to offset the need to increase the millage rate within the school district's boundaries. Approved this 21st day of May, 2018. <laughs> reading, I want to thank my reading teachers over the years. Okay. Or fire them. Uh, <laughs> item or fire them? Yeah. Fire okay. Them. <laughs> I was a public school. Okay. Um, <laughs> item number three: public comments. We have one person signed up. Tom Azell, are you still here? Tom, come on up. Please. Uh, oh, we, you can turn that around if you if you're so inclined. There you go. And please state your name and address. And it's pronounced Isley. Isley, okay. Very good. Okay. And your address is? Uh, 3028 Point Clear Drive. Thank you. Okay. Um, thumbing through the channels, I came upon the meeting from council, and I don't know if this is the place to bring it up, or are we going to have further meetings in public opinions on the water tower, the... I know we need the police station, the garbage fee, and tax increase. We are going to have more meetings on at least the water tower and the tax increase, if that is proposed. And what was your other one? The police station is probably going to be well, solved tonight. The, uh, millage. 
the millage. Increase. Yeah, that's that's all part of that. For, that's for, for a later mills, date. So I guess it is. Sorry. For, for mill. I believe he's referring to information that was provided during the workshop uh, as to how to offset that um, that gap, that funding gap, um, as we discussed, uh, I believe, last Thursday. Right. So are we going to have a millage increase and a garbage increase? Um, no. I know people think right that now. That will not be staff's recommendation, no. What would you prefer? Um, from what I heard, I'd have to get some more information on it. That's what we're going to do. And is this going to be just one or all? Is this going to be a garbage thing to pay for things? Is it going to be a millage increase, one or the other? We haven't we haven't even got that far yet. Okay. Um, you know, there's speculation around the neighborhood. Well, old Tiga K is going to pay for the new water tower that we need. Just You're way ahead of us. We haven't got there either. Okay. Um, approximately, do we know when discussions would begin? Is there going to be any meetings set up? I'm out of town a lot. I very seldom get to a meeting, and this concerns me a lot, and I'm sure it's going to concern a lot of other citizens because our taxes here are some of the highest in the state, if not second or third in the state, and nobody wants to see a tax increase. How long have you lived here? Approximately 10 years now. When was the last time we raised taxes? Nine years ago. Uh, nine said. years ago. Nine years ago, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've had four millage increases high since then, 1990. Yeah, still high now, so we're already getting comments, so <laughs> I'm sure some people are here for this subject, so they would like to know when some of these meetings are going to be and, and uh, when we can contribute our comments further. Well, we always post the, um, the agenda uh, at least a week or so beforehand. I don't know when those dates are coming up yet. We haven't really decided when we're going to discuss that. Have we got a date for that yet? We're still pretty far out from that. Correct. So, but if you'll keep up with the agenda on, on the online, that'll give you all the information you need. We will always post it. It'll not be a secret. Okay. And I know you were talking about uh, pushing through maybe the garbage increase first. Well, First, well, it would be to one get or the, the other. Money quicker, because that yeah. would be the quickest. Way. It'll be one or the other, or a combination of neither. But yeah, yeah, we haven't got that far. That, those are some of the proposals on the on the table. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to talk more on it. I know my time is up. Okay. So, thank you. But, thank uh, you very much for coming. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Thanks for coming. <clears throat> okay. Item number four is the approval of regular city council meetings. Are there any additions or deletions to the minutes? Hearing none, they will be posted as such. Uh, item number five, committee appointments. Do we have the committee appointments ready yet? Yes, sir, we do. Um, based on uh, the, ca the ballots submitted by council, um, I would like to push forward for council's approval for the Planning Commission, uh, Katie Forbes, for the Board of Zoning Appeals, uh, Clint Parker, and for TKK Forever, Patrick Britz and Lisa Kennedy. Okay, well, thank you for uh, everybody who volunteered. Um, I'm sure we're going to have a few more. We need a motion in a second oh. to approve the. Uh, motion to approve the um, the appointees as recognized. Second. Yes, that'll second work. by Gus Machinas. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Unanimous. Good enough. Great. Item six: unfinished business. Let me get to my notes here. More reading. Okay, uh, item number 6A, unfinished business. Second reading of an ordinance to amend chapter 14, articles 2 of licenses and of the code. So in 2013, the city did adopt the state's model business license ordinance. In doing so, the city also adopted the 2012 business license class schedule by NAICS code. During the conversation regarding the business licenses with the state leaders last summer, it was made clear the cities who have business license program need to be consistent. Um, this amendment to the code of ordinance allows for the city adoption, for the official adoption of the 2016 business license scheduled by NAC, NAICS code and allows for council to adopt subsequent revisions of the document, which for TAK will be 
will be with the annual adoption of the budget ordinances going forward. This will allow TAK to use the same class schedule that all surrounding judiciaries, jurisdictions are using each year. Is that clear to everybody? Yes, sir. All right, I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, members of council, I'd like to make a motion to approve the second reading of an ordinance to amend Chapter 14, Article 2, Licenses of the Code. I have a motion by Ryder and Shard. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Alicia Dash. Are there any public comments on this? Hearing none, are there any council comments? Yes, sir. Nope. All in favor of this, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? It's unanimous. 6B, the city received an, an appropriate petition to annex the, re are we gonna do this before? Um, this is your second read, you've already done all Gotcha, the I, I'm on the, the wrong, wrong page. Yes. The city has received an appropriate petition to annex the reference tax map number from the owner of the property. The petition has been reviewed by the state, by the staff and planning commission, and we have had public comments as required by the law on the matter. The developer's engineer has determined that the addition of the property to the residential portion of the PDD is necessary to prove the grading plan and construction. Adding the property will provide the necessary degree of slope, eliminate the need for a very large retaining wall, and improve the overall erosion and stormwater control plan. If the council elects to adopt this ordinance, the city will be annexing plus or minus two acres, rezoning it from RUD in the county to PDD in the city, and will be amending the game on PDD to include this parcel into its boundaries. No other changes will be made to the PDD, such as increase or decrease in the density. Are there any questions? I will entertain a motion. Motion to approve the second reading of an ordinance to annex plus or minus two acres identified as tax map number 644-00-00-022 and rezone from RUD in the county to PDD in the city and to amend the game on PDD to include the reference parcel. I have a motion from Heather Overman. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Ryan Richard. Are there any questions from the gallery? Any questions of council? No, all right. Hearing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Unanimous. Okay, seven, item seven. Chris Leonard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in the matter of a consideration to rezone tax map 644-00-00-001 from RUD in the county, R10 in the city is part of a part, a, as part of a 100% annexation pe petition. That's the Gardendale property. Uh, the Planning Commission voted to recommend that rezoning. In the matter of considering a recommendation to re rezone tax map 645-00-00027 and 645-00-00040 from RC1 in the county to R15 in the city as part of a 100% annexation petition, the Planning Commission voted to not recommend that rezoning. Thank you. All right, item 7B, uh, this is an introduction. The first reading of an ordinance necessary to, for the annexation and sub subsequent rezoning of 10 acres loaded on, located on Gardendale Road. The applicant is to build a maximum of 18 single-family homes at an average price of $600,000 per home. The requested zoning is R10, which is a minimum lot of 10,000 square feet by 80-foot lot width, 10-foot side back setbacks 25 feet front and 25 feet rear the sketch plan for the development shows a typical lot size of 95 feet by 115 feet with an, which exceeds the development standards as outlined below the streets within the development would the streets within the development would private and each unit would be private and each unit contained within would be subject to the school and the city's forthcoming impact fee. Staff recommendation is to approve the annexation and requested zoning. Is that clear to everybody? All right, on 7B, I will consider a motion. I will consider a motion. Let's do that. Hearing no motion, I can tell that this council is not interested in annexing or building houses. But in order to put it on public record, I would like to make a motion. Motion to approve the introduction of the first reading of the ordinance to rezone tax map 644-00-00-001 from RUD in the county to R10 in the city as part of a 100% annex position. 
Do I have a second? Second. Second by Ryan Richard. Any public comments? Any council comments? I have a yes. Just one quick one. Are we, as a city, are we in the business of? Could we we could determine what developers have to sell. We could we could determine square footage and lot sizes and density, but we can't say you can't build a house that or you can't sell a house for less than six hundred thousand dollars. Correct. That is correct. Okay. Yeah, that that number is not a number that is generated by the city. Okay, thanks. Any questions? Uh, yeah. One. Go ahead. Go ahead. My question um, is going to be to you, Charlie. Actually, what? My concern with this particular annexation is this is only 18 houses. It doesn't seem like that big of, of you know, that many homes. What, before I would vote, I would kind of want to know what the precedent is. So how many acres are left? How many more 18 home, 20 home, potentially 30 home developments could we have potentially in the city down the road? In the way of new uh, potential annexations? Right. That, uh, yeah, and I know you can't speak to the future. You don't know right. exactly what's going to happen, but how much land do we actually have left that would could There's potentially do this? Out, outside but contiguous to the city uh, limits, um, meaning that if a petition were received today, it's already contiguous. It's not waiting on another parcel in between, so to speak. It's really not that many. I mean, you're probably less than 100 acres. Uh, left around the in, uh, entire you know, borders of the city, uh, and that may even be a high number. So there's there's really not that many left um, due to rezonings that uh, have occurred um, in the county outside of the city limits um, over the last probably three, four, five years. There's not a whole lot of undeveloped land uh, contiguous to the city. Um, now, having said that, yeah, you know, down the road, I mean, there may be potential for uh, rezonings for redevelopment, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. But, um, yeah, most of it has just come online over the last three to five years sure. uh, adjacent to us. So you'd have to get a petition, you know, in order to bring them in. Obviously, there's, there's an annexation <laughs> process for that. And bringing in things that are already um, developed generally you don't see a right. whole lot. So, I mean, as far as future annexation abilities, um, I mean, obviously you, you've got the state law, but uh, as far as realistically, uh, they're going to be few and far between. A lot of what you've got left are uh, what we consider to be donut holes. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then you've got a few parcels that are outside of those donut holes, but not very many um, due to the growth on 160. And then obviously we've got some geographic challenges, you know, with the lake and the sure. river and the state line. So um, I'm assuming we're not going to jump across state lines and start annexing things in North Carolina. But um, so, yeah, you really don't have that many more opportunities. Okay. Gus? I have just one quick question. We were missing, I think, the word B in the executive summary. Do I read that to mean those streets will be private? And the city will not be responsible for their upkeep and maintenance. That is that is how it is proposed. Yes, sir. You have little, little, very little impact to city services um, in that regard. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Should we make comments now, or you can make comments now <clears throat> before we vote. Okay. So I just want to make a, a few comments before we begin, and and really just talk about what I experienced when I was on the, the campaign trail, which was just a few months ago. And it was listening to a lot of residents throughout the city of TK say that we have too much residential development, too much residential development. And, um, and I think council recognized that when a couple um, meetings ago, we went ahead and approved the impact fee um, analysis. And, and so, Listening to what the community has told me and the efforts that this council is making to try to really evaluate what is the impact of residential development on city services, on city infrastructure, um, it's, it's hard for me to support this. And so I just want, want to, to put that out there and say that. Um, I appreciate you coming and, and applying for this and, and wanting to be a part of TKK because it's an it's amazing community. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm going to have to vote no, and a lot of that has to do with just what I've heard from the, the people I represent. And not only that, but we're also in the process of this impact analysis, and so I think that it's best to wait, for us to wait, 
um, see the results of that so that we really understand that when new homes are built within our jurisdiction, what that means. Um, so that's just what I wanted Anybody to, else to say. I have a motion and a second. No, sir, it's, we're finished. Um, all in favor, signify by saying aye. All opposed, no. no. Yeah. It's unanimous, five to nothing, the, mission, the motion fails. Look at the 7C. Okay, this is the introduction of first reading of an ordinance to rezone tax map numbers 6450000027 and 6450000040 to rezone approximately 8.7 acres along Vineland, Vineland Vineyard Road as a residential subdivision R15. Total proposed residential density would be a maximum of three single family homes. R15 minimum lot standards are a 15,000 square foot lot size and 90 foot lot width. 10 foot size setbacks and 25 foot front and 25 foot rear setbacks. If annexed, this property would provide a road connection from River Falls to Vineyard Road as this future growth connection could help drive more people to the commercial areas in the city and minimal impact to the city and Fort Mill School District resources. Staff recommends approval for this annexation and the Planning Commission just recommended against. So with that, I'll listen to a motion. Does anybody have a motion? Do over. So what's that? Hearing no motion, let's move to item 7D. Executive summary, the city advertised for the submission of design and build proposals to construct the new police station. Proposals were received and respondents were interviewed. Staff is recommending that the project be awarded to Randolph and Sons builders based on their approach and familiarity with the project in addition to the fact that they were the lowest qualified bidder. I will consider a motion for the police station. Motion to approve, Ma Mayor and members of council. Motion to approve project award for the new police station to Randolph and Son Bil Sons Builders and authorize the city manager to proceed forward with executing the necessary contract documents and notice to proceed shall not be issued until such time that council has approved the funding necessary for the project. I have a motion from Alicia Dash. Do I have a second? Second. A second from Ryan Richard. Are there any public comments on the police station? Hearing none, city council comments on the police station? Hearing none. Um, okay, it's time to vote. All those in favor of the police station signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? It's unanimous. Item 7E. This is the design and engineering of the police station. In order to, to get to final budget pricing on the police station, the city manager needs to begin working with Randolph and Son Builders on architectural, civil, structural, plumbing, mechanical, and soils. These engineering tasks must, be, must get underway as soon as possible in order to arrive at a final price for council to consider funding. These are all considered soft costs and, can, and the city can reimburse itself for these expenses once the, it closes and financing of overall project. These expenses were part of the overall bid price for a total of 266500 Council, I will ask for a motion. Mr. Mayor, members of council, I'd like to make a motion to approve the design and engineering of police station, of the police station at a price not to exceed $266,500 thousand five hundred dollars and authorize the city manager to use reserve funds as necessary and authorize the city manager to replace those funds back into the city's cash reserves upon closing on the financing of the overall project. I have a motion from Ryan Shard. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Gus Muchinas. I say that right? Yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, are there any um, members of the public that would like to make any comments? Yes, sir. Step forward, please. I just like to know please step you, forward. Come, come to the mic, please. Tom Isley, same address. Right. You hadn't moved since then. I just wanted to know where it's going to be. In front of the current police station. Okay. And we'll With a 40-foot setback from the street. Okay. Um, will this have a jail? Six-hour holding facilities, yeah. not a jail. Okay. So we arrest somebody, 
we will bring them back to the station. They'll be in a holding cell until they're either bonded out or trans transported over to Moss Justice. But it is only a six hour maximum holding uh, facility. Okay, will we be able to see a design of this in the future? As soon as, as soon as council takes a vote, I actually, Mayor, oh. I've got some slides where okay. I can show everybody the, the floor plan. Okay. So you can see it. Thanks. Thank so. you. Yes, Thank sir. you, Mr. Isley. Any more public comments? Seeing none, any public, any comments from the council? All right, let's go to the vote. All in favor of this proposal, signify, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, unanimous. Charlie Funderburg. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I know we talked about this, and don't worry that this is so small on the screen because I'm going to blow it up here in just a second. This is the, uh, the floor plan uh, for the proposed facility. Um, so I'm gonna, we're going to talk through kind of the walk you uh, counterclockwise around the station, starting uh, with the front lobby and the conference room. Um, so as you come through the, the center doors there off the front porch, come through the vestibule, you'll see towards the top right of that image uh, the dispatch and records clerk. Uh, there's two little white rectangles in front of them. Those are service windows. Um, with this proposal, uh, and as we, as we are able to move forward uh, with our conversations with council, um, our vision is when we open this facility, we will bring dispatch services back uh, under the city and no longer have that contracted out with the county. Uh, and that will give us a person at a window to be able to talk to you face-to-face 24-7 -face in the new facility uh, the way we, we used to have uh, probably 10 years ago. Um, the records clerk will serve as that, that receptionist type person during normal business hours. Uh, with the dispatcher uh, assisting with those duties outside of normal hours uh, as well as on uh, weekends. Uh, you see to the left uh, is a nice, a nice size training room, uh, roll call room, conference room type thing. Um, that will be used to do uh, in-house training instead of having to send our officers uh, out for 100% of their training. Also allows uh, Chief Parker and his staff uh, to do community engagement um, with, with sizable groups uh, there at the facility. Um, and then you, you'll also see we've got our reporting um, uh, victim uh, and conference room there off of the main lobby. Outside of uh, normal business hours, someone comes in, they'll always be able to get through the front door, but they won't be able to get out of the, uh, proceed forward out of the vestibule area until they're buzzed in by the dispatcher. Uh, and there'll be cameras and monitors and things like that. So the dispatcher can talk back and forth with them and then, and then let them proceed further into the building. Uh, during normal business hours, they'll be able to go through the first two doors, but then they're not able to get out, out of the lobby uh, without prior authorization. Um, and then you can see behind the dispatch area our, our record storage. So let's move to the next part there. This is, um, I refer to this as our command staff wing. Um, in here, you've got the chief's office, his executive assistant, our captain. Um, you've got storage um, there to the, to the top side. You also see our community relations officer. Uh, right now that is uh, Sergeant Burns, as well as a dedicated storage area for, for him with all the things that he has uh, that go along with our uh, community events that the police department does. Um, the lower left office there um, is potentially um, uh, future office space. Uh, so there's one thing we do like about this design is it does allow for future growth under the existing rooftop without having to do additions and things of that nature. Um, as we continue on down and we get into that front right corner, so that corner will be the closest to City Hall as you're looking at the, just to orient yourself. Um, the, where we came from, the corner we started from is closer to the, uh, what is now the existing boat storage lot. So down here, this is where our patrol and our investigation folks are. Um, the yellow offices to the top, our detective, you've got interview rooms, and then that office space to the top left um, is future office space as we are able to add uh, more detectives. So obviously nobody in there at this point in time. You'll have workstations, that's what those dotted lines are indicating uh, for our um, uh, 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 patrol officers. And then you'll have uh, day, sh day, day shift sergeants in one office, night shift sergeants uh, in the other office uh, where you see the patrol sergeants. Um, obviously, they don't work at the same time, so they're able to, to share that area. Uh, our patrol lieutenant uh, next to them, and then, again, an additional office space 
uh, as we are as we're able to continue to grow grow our uh, patrol uh, moving forward. Uh, you also have a side entrance into a vestibule area and then to the hallway uh, off of that end of the building as well. You can kind of make that out in the top right corner. Um, speaking of which, uh, let's move to that area. Uh, we heard from council, both uh, prior council as well as, as uh, some, uh, those currently on council, um, the um, need or desire to not have the sally port visible from the street. Uh, as you go down TGK Drive, they didn't want to see officers marching in, uh, prisoners in handcuffs, into the building the way it is now. Um, this, the sally port is a, is a pull-in sally port off of a secure parking lot. Um, that secure parking lot will be in between the police station and current city hall. Uh, from there, they will walk them through a secure access down into the processing and holding facility. Getting into the building area uh, down below the sally port, this is where you've got your break room, your armory, uh, your gun cleaning area, as well as locker rooms and a PT area for our police officers. Um, this, is, this is something, I, the, the locker room I'm actually excited about because as it is now, our police officers have to put on their entire patrol uniform, hop in their Honda Accord, and then drive, drive to work. This gives them the ability, will give them the ability to finally you know, come to work, maybe PT beforehand, shower, get ready for their shift, and then and be able to keep their uniforms here if they, if they choose to. Um, currently, if you have not been inside our police, our current police station, there are two bathrooms, um, I think with two toilet fixtures in each, or one, two toilets in each? With two toilets in each, and that's for our prisoners, for our staff and everybody else. So get a little, get a little elbow room in the, in the restrooms with this new facility. Um, as we continue to move down that, that, back, uh, that back area, here's where all the fun happens. Uh, this is where we bring our, um, our folks that are just choosing not to follow the rules. Uh, bring them in through a secured access into that vestibule. You've got the processing area, uh, your BA room. Um, that room is, is controlled and monitored by SLED. And then you can see the two uh, six-hour holding facilities. Uh, and then you've got janitorial closets in there. Um, one thing to note that the electrical room uh, there to the top left, we have that specifically having the door open to the outside so that we can bring contractors in to, if they have to do repairs and things like that, Without having to certify them through SLED and babysit them and everything else, um, they won't have access to the NCIC and things of that nature. So that's why we, we, uh, we had them design it that way. Uh, continuing on, um, the last area, uh, this is our evidence area and a lot of our future growth you can see there in the top right corner. Um, right now, that's, that would be envisioned just as flex space. Um, pretty good size. It does allow for multiple offices or additional meeting space. Um, could event, yeah, if necessary, additional evidence storage, uh, things like that. Again, trying to keep as much flex space under the roof um, so that we can grow into this building over the next 20, 25 years um, and not, not have just a 10-year building. Um, so in there, you've got your evidence tech, your evidence processing and storage. Um, how's your going bad? Our IT staff um, and data storage. Um, there towards the, uh, the left-hand side, uh, our professional standards office, as well as uh, uniform storage, uh, things of that nature. Again, you have another um, secured uh, entry point there to the side. This one, we can actually bring folks in through that vestibule and then um, directly into the uh, training slash large conference room. So they wouldn't have to necessarily come directly through the lobby. We could bring them in that way. And then you'll see to the top left corner with the way we're situating the building on the existing site, if somehow we do outgrow this building or we do need to add you know, much more additional um, uh, evidence storage and things like that, we do have room on, on site off of that end, off of that back corner there uh, for future expansion. Um, it is our hope that um, this is done long after I retire. <laughs> and that conversation happens at that point. So that's, that's just kind of a, a quick uh, tour through the building uh, so to speak. Um, council, I do want to show you, these are your front elevations. So you, um, still going to make some tweaks uh, to that porch area uh, to really make it feel like a, a front porch um, yeah, and inviting. We want folks to come in, see our, our law enforcement staff um, on a positive note, not because they're being forced to. Um, but realistically, this is where we've got a couple of options. Um, this one shows it with a, a stone, uh, stacked stone veneer to the bottom. 
uh, below the uh, uh, the hardy plank um, siding uh, to the top, and then this one would be a, a match of the brick similar to City Hall. Um, this is more in lines with what we did with the new fire station, uh, blends well in that Serenity Point um, and Stonecrest Villas area, um, where it's right adjacent to uh, existing residential. The new station obviously is right across the street from existing residential, so um, not tonight, but um, just something to consider, and I can send council these images uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, definitely want council's uh, input as far as whether you want the stack stone or whether you want the brick. I'm good either way. Mm -hmm. Chief is good either way. So, um, yeah, just if, if you if you have your druthers and want to want to shoot those to me, definitely want to hear that. Do what? Vinyl siding. Vinyl siding, absolutely. <laughs> yes, sir. What does Officer Gordon want? <laughs> <laughs> He's good either way. All right. <laughs> I don't want to upset Officer so, Gordon. So, um, yeah, obviously we we've tried, to, um, and it's hard to tell here. Um, let me back up one. You can you can get a little bit of a glimpse of it here. Uh, from the overall, uh, from the elevated uh, floor plan, um, where we've recessed some areas, given some contours, trying to give some depth um, uh, as we could to the building. Um, as we work through the actual site plan, where the building sits and the driveways are and things of that nature uh, over the coming weeks, uh, we envision there to be um, garden type space, you know, uh, nice landscaping out in front of this uh, to make it warm and inviting. Similar, uh, when, and when I say garden space, I'm not talking the memorial gardens, mm -hmm. not to that level, but something in line with uh, similar to what we have in front of City Hall uh, to invite people in. Um, yeah, we, uh, we want the people to view this as a, as a space that they, they don't mind coming to visit um, you know, and not have it as industrial looking uh, as you, see, you may see uh, police stations in, in larger cities and things of that nature. So uh, again, we're still working, uh, having conversations with the architect, obviously until we got through the, the vote that council just took. They're a little hesitant to do too much work on the front end until they knew they were going to actually get paid for some of that work. So, uh, but they do understand that we're still looking for them to to soften it a little more. You know, they've they've been able to add a lot, uh, several more windows uh, across the front. Um, yeah, we're we're talking through. You know, maybe um, not the not the hurricane shutters, but um, that that lift up almost gives it almost a, like a coastal feel kind of thing. So, looking through some of those things, but obviously don't want to go overboard and, and run the risk of of elevating that price too high. We want to definitely make sure we can do what we need to do on the inside, but uh, trying to keep the the exterior finishes um, soft and inviting. So that's where we are now, Mayor. Charlie, not to catch you off guard anything, but um, to Tom Isley uh, comments. We've got to figure out how to pay for this, and we've got an impact fee coming up. Now, that impact fee, just the day we vote on it, doesn't mean we have the money. It's paid at the time of each house is permitted. That is correct. So we still have to come up with a, a, a way to figure out how to pay for this. And every correct. time we get a house, uh, people pay for their, their impact fee through that. It gets offset to the police station immediately, right? To, to a certain extent. Um, the impact fees don't pay for the full nugget of, of anything That's unless right. that one capital item is specific to that, i.e. the water tower. Uh, the water tower is needed to serve communities that are approved but not constructed yet. Okay, Windhaven, River Falls, things like that. So there's a potential, the way the state code reads on impact fees, it is to require them to, to pay their proportionate share. Okay, so would some impact fees go to the police station? Yes, but it may only be 5%, not the full amount. So we would consider that when we figured out how, to, how we're gonna pay for this, that we're gonna, we know we're gonna get X amount because we got 1,500 more houses, as an example, that are coming to TUK. Mm -hmm. And we would know what the, police, what the police station impact fee would be, or public safety, whatever, whatever it's gonna be called. We, it, because of some of the, the external constraints, uh, the jail facilities, yeah, uh, having to transport to Moss Justice and things of that nature, I'm, I'm a little hesitant on waiting until council has adopted the impact fees to bring a funding solution. Um, the funding solution that we, would, that we would bring and propose to council, uh, and we're hoping you know, at, the, at the July council meeting to, to bring that forward uh, as, a, as a first read, 
uh, would not include impact fees as part of it because though we won't be there yet with impact fees. We'll be pretty close. Um, yeah, I, I hope that impact fee, we um, be doing first read on impact fees at the same meeting. Um, but realistically, it may not be until August before okay. you're doing impact fees. Um, but we'll have an explanation through that that basically here's, here's the way that, that it can be funded. Um, staff is, I can tell you right now, I'm not planning on uh, proposing a tax increase to fund this. Um, we are working through, and as we talked through at the workshop, basically our proposal would be to offset or free up tax revenues um, by charging, a poor, charging for trash um, at $10 per house per month um, and freeing up the tax revenues that we have that can offset the expense of this, that can offset the expense of, of other needs um, that we're identifying. Obviously, we've got a strategic planning workshop June 9th with council. Um, I think, yeah, based on the fact that, I mean, I think there's over 300 people that have already taken the, the survey just over the weekend. There's been focus group meetings. Staff really wants to hear from council, yeah, and work through that strategic planning workshop. Um, to see what other needs, what priorities um, uh, we need to set and work through. Um, yeah, yeah, charging ten dollars per house per month, while on today's rooftops would add four hundred eighty thousand, would free up four hundred eighty thousand dollars in the budget. You'd be surprised based on the priorities and capital projects and things of that, just in existing TGK, that 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 could get eaten up very quickly. Um, yeah. Keep in mind also your impact fees can also help offset some of the debt like on the fire station that was just taken out. Yeah, so that's going to free up some money as well. Um, I'm concerned that if we wait to bring a funding, a full funding solution that includes impact fees, it's going to be costing us more money down the road with the transporting of prisoners and things of that nature. Uh, it's going to make it very difficult. I, I think it's going to be hard to, hard to wait those additional months. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. So there's, um, there's a good preview of what's to come. So stay tuned. All right. All right. <laughs> we'll take that consideration. <laughs> Item number 7F uh, is a purchase agreement for tax map 65400013. Oh, this is the Catawba Park. This is a very exciting concept for me. Um, we've been talking about Catawba Park for 10 years. 10 years. years yeah. And it was, and the plan was because we couldn't get the land, it was going to be for three softball fields. And everybody says you have to have four ball fields in order to have tournaments. And, and we were basically building something that wasn't going to be used unless we had four ball fields. There's the three right there. Mm -hmm. So let me get to the ordinance. This is very exciting. Um, the city has been approached by the owner of the property immediately adjacent to the current dog park location on New Gray Rock Road in reference to the city purchasing said property. Acquiring this parcel would allow for the addition of an additional baseball softball diamond in Catawba Park plan, taking it to a total of four baseball softball fields. The purchase price of the parcel has been negotiated down to $100,000 for approximately 1.2 acres of land. So this is, this shows that we are very, that we are really trying to get Catawba Park going. This is a big, big, big step for acquiring this land. Council, I will consider a motion. Mr. Motion. Mayor, and <laughs> go ahead, Gus. I just want to get one. Yeah. Mr. Mayor and Council, I'd make a make, like to make a motion to approve the purchase agreement for tax map 65400013 to be included as part of Catawba Park at a purchase price not to exceed $100,000 and to authorize the city manager to work with the city attorney to execute all necessary closing documents. I have a motion by Gus Machinas. Do I have a second? Second. A second by Heather Overman. Are there any public comments on this? This is very exciting news. I can't believe you all aren't jumping out of your seats. I'm jumping out of my seat. All right, hearing none, are there any council comments? I'll just oh. say as the liaison for the TKK Forever Foundation, I'm really excited about this. Um, we're finally picking up some steam and moving in the right direction, and I can't wait to make this become a reality. So. This is a big deal, folks. I'm telling you, any other comments? I have a motion, I have a second. It's time to vote. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? It is unanimous. This is a good thing. I'm glad we're getting that land. We're going to move on with that park. Item 7G, um, at the regular meeting on May 7th, 2018, the Planning Commission approved the final plat for Cameron Creek Phase 9, contingent upon approval of the letter of credit and performance labor and materials surety agreement. We have received a letter from the city engineer certifying certain improvements have been installed, and this 
Letter includes an opinion of probable cost to complete the required infrastructure. The required improvements are to be bonded by a letter of credit in the amount of $46,650.77. I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, members of council, I'd like to make a motion to approve the letter of credit in the amount of $46,650.77 and the performance labor and materials surety agreement for Cameron Creek phase nine. I have a motion from Ryan Rissard. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Alicia and Dash. <laughs> Are there any comments, public comments? Any council comments? None by Alicia Dash? Yes, sir. I have a motion and a second. It's time to vote. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, unanimous. <clears throat> Whew. I have a reading instruction. Oh, this one's kind of near and dear to my heart also. Discussion related to surface water runoff during rain events. Uh, with all the rain we've had over the past several weeks, many residents have been contacting city staff and some members of city council with concerns about surface water runoff. The city manager has been asked to facilitate, facilitate a discussion this evening explaining what the difference is between point source and non-point source runoff and who has what responsibilities when it, with, when it concerns the surface water draining across someone's property. As last Tuesday, was it? We had about a two and a half inches of rain in 27 minutes. Yes. And my garage flooded, yes. and I had just spent about $2,000 to clear out all my drains underneath the house. Mm -hmm. And here it comes, because I knew this rain was going to be coming. We've all been seeing it on the news. We're going to have 10, 11, 12 days of rain. Yes. And the first thing that hit flooded mm -hmm. me out. And I know a lot of other people have been calling in. Uh, yes, Mr. Mr. Jim back there and I have been talking for a couple of years mm -hmm. now. And... And I, Alicia took me to a, a friend of hers house whose garage, it comes right down the common driveway. Mm -hmm. And several people are always talking about rainwater. And I know rainwater is a common enemy to everybody around here with mm -hmm. the slopes. And depending on where you live, it could really be ca cause a torrential stream behind you. Right. So I just wanted to open this up for discussion with everybody to see how we can fix this or how we can understand who is responsible at what times? Go ahead. Yeah. I've got, um, if I can, Mayor, I've got a couple of slides just to kind of walk through the differences between point source, non-point source okay. solution. Um, might help with uh, some of the discussion. Uh, and we so, will allow public comment too uh, as soon as this is over. Yeah. So surface water, as the Mayor said, uh, is considered a common enemy. The property owner has the right but not the obligation to control surface water while it is on their property. Uh, so while basically in a nutshell, while the water, the surface water moving across the ground is on your property, you can do with it basically what you want. You can choose to control it. You can choose to just let it pass, let it sit. It's up to you. Uh, you're not obligated to do anything with it if you choose not to. Um, this is just a diagram um, I, I tried to put together um, showing in a typical uh, neighborhood, uh, you know, well, this could be you know, anywhere in Lake Ridge, Lake Shore, uh, Serenity Point, things like that. These are your typical drainage type patterns, um, you know, where you've got your, your surface water flowing, obviously, away from the house. Uh, they're required to have a 2%, 2 fall away from the house uh, at a minimum just to meet code. Um, and then that water is either going to fall you know, in the rear yard, packed to a drainage swell, the side yards to, the, to those swells or even coming out the front, uh, getting in the city's uh, storm sewer system, curb and gutter and things like that. This would be considered non-point, okay? It, it, the water is not channelized. Um, after all the rain we've had uh, over the last several weeks, we've probably got a lot of yards during those big heavy downpours like the mayor was mentioning that probably resembles something like this. So then everybody wants to go out and fix that. Um, and. The, Inadvertently, sometimes they end up doing what is called point sourcing, which is the channelization of water directly onto another property or directly into a body of water. Uh, point sourcing, you cannot do, all right? Um, that, that is a big no-no. Um, what they end up doing, so you've got the yard to the left, it's flooded, a lot of standing water there. Their solution, let's go in and put in a French drain, uh, some type of underground drainage system, that's fine. Uh, but you got to give the water a chance to spread out or unchannelize before it leaves your property. So if you've got a you know, low area and you decide to put in, you know, go to Lowe's and get one of those um, yard drain, 12-inch yard drain boxes and put it in the low area to get the water out, 
You can pipe it to a low spot, but you cannot run that line all the way to your property line and then let it just shoot right onto your neighbor's property. Uh, you can't run it directly to um, the lake if you happen to live on, on the lake. Um, you've got to give the water as it comes out of the pipe a chance to unchannelize before it leaves your property. Um, this is a, a flared in. Now granted, most people aren't going to have something this robust on private property. Um, you've got a flared in at the end of a pipe and then off the end of that you've got uh, what is called a rock apron. Um, that's going to slow the velocity down, but again it's going to encourage that water to fan out um, and not just dig trenches. Um, like it would if it's coming channelized out of a pipe. Um, so again, um, differences between point source and non-point source. Um, property owners have the right, but not the obligation uh, to control water as it comes uh, across their property. If it is sheet flowing across your neighbor's property and sheet flowing onto yours, that's, that's not a violation. It's not illegal, uh, it doesn't violate DHEC regulations. Um, it is considered a common enemy. Um, now, if your neighbor has hooked up all their downspouts on their gutter system, piped them all right to your right to the property line, and has it all discharging directly onto your property, that is point source solution. They've got to bring that pipe back and give it the, again, as I, as I said previously, the opportunity for it to unchannelize or to fan out before it leaves uh, leaves their property. So. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of that. Um, I tell you back in 2007, 2008, we weren't getting any stormwater calls because we're in the middle of a drought. Um, but with the rain that we've had, you've got very saturated ground now. No, you're going to get more runoff now than what you would, um, if the, if the ground wasn't as saturated as what it is. So we're getting more and more calls. Um, obviously we go out and investigate, talk to the homeowners. Um, we try to give suggestions as we can on things that they could potentially do. Um, the biggest thing that, that we find in a lot of areas is, um, yeah, the, hey, the street drain is flooding and it's yeah, out in front of my house and it, now it's flooding my front yard. Um, I actually worked on a project uh, back when I was operations director here. We go out, start trying to find the outfall of that pipe and it's buried with yard debris and dirt and trees and leaves. Water has no way to get out. Um, so, you know, be cognizant of those things. Um, that's one reason why we asked Folks, when they're putting out their yard debris, keep it behind the curb so that it's not clogging up the storm drains and things like that. Let the water get to where it needs to get to. Um, a lot of it's just education, you know, as we go out and talk to folks and explain to them things similar to this to where they understand it. Uh, traditional TKK um, obviously has uh, probably more challenges um, than, you know, Lakeshore and, and, the, and the other developments, strictly because of topography. I mean, there's not a lot of flat ground in traditional TGK, and pretty much everywhere there was flat ground, we've got a park <laughs> or a ball field on. So um, that that creates uh, additional issues. Um, you know, we've got folks that live at, you know, their, their home is below street grade at the end of a cul-de-sac that is heading downhill right towards their front door. That's where the water's headed, you know. Um, Let me give you three examples, maybe sure. coming on. Go ahead. Um, one would be on a torrential rain when it jumps the curb and it gets in your yard. You know, that before you comment. And then the other two is pretty common is somebody's had their house there for a while and then somebody builds next door and maybe they've removed trees or something like that and causing the water to, to act differently. Or they put a driveway right up to the property line and it just comes right down that driveway right into the next person's yard. If you can comment on those three different examples there. Well, one, one, one thing I can say for certain is None of the three examples you gave adds volume, if that makes sense, okay? If they're, if they're in a drainage area, okay, whether they take, whether they, you know, level the trees, they add a driveway, things of that nature, that's not going to change the volume of water that is going through that drainage area. The only thing that can change the volume of water is the person making it rain. Um, you know, you're going to get the same amount of the same volume of water through that drainage area in a two inch storm, two inch rainfall, whether that driveway is, is there or whether that driveway is not. Now, a lot of times what, what those changes may do is may increase velocity. Uh, is it, is it, you know, as you pick up those impervious areas, um, yeah, it, it may change velocity and things of that nature. Uh, but it, it, it doesn't change the, the volume. Now, if 
water is flowing one direction and somebody comes and builds a new house and changes the direction that water flows. Now that's something that we're looking, we look at during the plan reviews for that house to make certain that the stormwater is controlled. Um, DHEC has a permitting process for clearing of less than an acre of land. Um, yeah, that's, that's not something that they had 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, if it wasn't a big development or you know, several acres of land, it was, okay, go do your thing. Now they, they've, I mean, and this has been this way, Tom, over the last probably 10, 15 years? Yeah, 10 or 12 years. Yeah, probably 10 or 12 years, only less than one acre uh, to where now we don't have very much of that in TKK. Where what about jumping the curbs? Jumping the curb, um, yeah, we, we, when we do get those calls, we go out and investigate. Our folks um, uh, with the fire department uh, join us uh, and come out with a pumper truck and release large volumes of water out of the pumper truck so we can actually see real time what the, what the water is actually doing. Um, yeah, in the instance you gave uh, earlier with the, the big storm we had, the, you know, two and a half, three inches of rain in, a, in a less than half an hour, that's at what is considered to be the 100-year storm uh, type volume, uh, and there's a there's a mathematical equation to that that puts it in that category. That's not you. Nobody designs, and it would be impractical to design storm sewer systems for those hundred year type storms, those flash flood type things. Now, if we're getting a half inch inch of rain, and somebody's like, hey, you know, it's it's jumping the curb, it's running down my driveway, it's flooding my garage, things like that. Well, we come out, we, we take a look, make sure, one, that the curb is installed properly, uh, and there's no defects there. And then we turn uh, those, those pumper trucks hold anywhere between 1,000 and 1,500 gallons, and we let it out in about two minutes. That's a lot. I mean, that's, that's that getting close to that 100-year storm-type volume to see, okay, is it following the curb and gutter the way it's supposed to, or is it jumping? And if it's jumping, then we start talking through solutions. Do we need to raise the curb? Instead of being a roll curb here, does it need to be a high back curb? Uh, and things of that nature. Um, usually we find that it's not jumping the curb during a normal rain event. Um, it, but yeah, um, on, on some of our streets where we've got a nice downhill grade uh, going into a cul-de-sac, I mean, there's been instances where we've had to go in and remove the roll curb at the end of that cul-de-sac and put a high back curb in. Um, to make sure that the water funnels around does get into the storm drains. All right. Council, have any comments? Okay, I'll allow public comments if somebody wants to come up and speak. I know Jim wants to speak. You want to go first? You can just go after Jim. Linda Stevenson, 3024 Point Clear Drive. Um, when we were working with the water and sewer company, there was a lot of water going into the storm drain from, from the sewerage. I'd like to commend the city because I think you've done a really great job Normally, we would have been out there in our golf carts overnight with all the rain we've had. So you, you guys have done a great job. But do we still have any problem with the sewage going into the storm drains? No, ma'am. Uh, there, there was never, um, as we've gone through that entire system, there, there were no cross connections. Okay, What we did find were uh, manholes that were allowing groundwater to seep in, and those manholes have been... Um, have been um, rehabbed, sealed up. Um, the gas is, um, you know, from the wastewater, starts to eat away at the concrete, makes them more porous. So when you get heavy saturated grounds like you have now, you start to have groundwater infiltrating into that, which adds to the, um, you know, what's going to the plants. Um, we did find one wet well that was built just on a slab. It, it was a piece of granite. That not, they didn't put the granite there. Uh, you know, when, when the earth was created, the granite was put there. And so instead of putting a concrete bottom on it, they just built right on there. Uh, that was over by a treatment plant too. So every time the lake levels, levels would rise, the bottom of the wet wells filling up with lake water, um, which was overtaking the plants. Now, have, we have not eliminated 100% of the INI. We'll never be able to, not without building a whole brand new system. We have significantly reduced it to where the plants can keep up. Um, whenever we do have high flow, but yeah, our, our guys, um, yeah, when we have these big prolonged rainstorms and things like that, yeah, they're working around the clock uh, in shifts and things like that, uh, making sure that we don't have the overflows um, because we do still have some INI um, to where the plants can, you know, I exceed that that peak demand flow. Yes, ma'am. Jim, uh, name and address, please. Um, Jim Mowry, uh, six twenty nine Andover Lane and Lakeshore. Um, first of all, I guess I'd like to congratulate and welcome new mayor, new members. 
Good to have you. Thanks. Thanks for your Four of us up here. Absolutely. Absolutely. I get nothing. Uh, I'm sorry. I can, for those of you that are still here, congratulations okay, for thank staying. You. Okay. No. Um, uh, stormwater issues and, and uh, uh, situations, I guess, just for discussion purposes. I know a couple of you probably uh, know me from uh, several conversations in the past. Stormwater has been a big issue, certainly for me and my property and, and some of my neighboring properties. We've got a, uh, at least five or six neighbors there that have really uh, kind of come together to try and uh, want to address the city or at least discuss with the city opportunities or, or ideas for, for mitigation of some of the stormwater there. Uh, it's, it's particularly concentrating there because it's, um, you've got uh, Fairway Point behind us, which is highly elevated, and then Andover Lane, which those of us on the, on the golf side, uh, yeah, golf course side of the street uh, have substantial lower elevation than what they do. So anyway, the, in a nutshell, I guess, we've got all those properties, a number of, of, of community properties in that particular area, and I know others, you know, David and, and, and others have mentioned, too, that they have issues, too. But I guess one of the, one of the things that I'm concerned, concerned about is, that, is the fact that when the, when the lots were being developed, I think the developer could have been thinking ahead, uh, making easements, making swales, ditches, what have you, to try and control it and send it to the natural areas like the collection pond by... Uh, green number 17 on the on, on Grandview and the pond that's there on 17 too. Just something that wasn't done. Um, obviously, it's something that the city, you know, has kind of acquired over time. Right. If if I can, um, the um, and, and maybe just as uh, for general purposes, when when a developer, uh, even Newland, when they were doing Lakeshore, um, whenever they come in and they they go through their plat approval process they can't pull permits until they get what is called SWIP approval. And SWIP is, it stands for Stormwater Prevention Pollution Plant. Okay, and that's part of their grading plan. Um, Lakeshore was actually done before the city became what is, what is called a MS4, or a Municipal s separate, s separate Storm Sewer System, okay, uh, which made us the permitting agency. Um, now, L Lakeshore, Serenity Point, and Lake Ridge were the last three that were fully permitted under DHEC. Since then, all developments have been done by the city as far as the permitting agency, okay? Now, but the process is still the same for the most part in that the engineers have to provide all of the, um, the, the calculations for pre and post uh, stormwater uh, runoff. Um, those regulations have to meet within a certain threshold. Um, their plans are scrutinized both by, well now by city engineers um, before it go. And it still has to go down to DHEC for them to comment on, even though we're the permitting agency now. So even, but with, with, um, with Lake Shore, uh, where you live, it went through all those processes, but it was scrutinized and, and <laughs> under DHEC's permitting. Um, so we were not allowed to issue the first grading permit in Lakeshore until DHEC blessed it and said, okay, the plans meet all the regulations, all the specifications. So um, now, could swells have been put in by the developer, you know, abundant, you know, looking 30 years in the future, things like that? Probably. I mean, obviously I'm familiar with your situation. Uh, yeah, I mean, hindsight 2020, yeah, maybe there should have been a swell put there. Um, but again, it met all the regulations that were specified um, by SEDHEC. Now, the problem, well, I guess it's not a problem, it's a good thing, but for future developers, one of the things we see is those regulations get more and more stringent you know, as, as you move forward, um, which, you know, so your stormwater and erosion control plans uh, 10 years from now are going to be much more robust than what they are now. Um, you know, as new technologies, new information becomes available. Again, we follow exactly what DHEC pushes out. Um, no, no more, no less, because anything more or less than that would be pretty arbitrary on our point. You know, so it, they, they are scrutinized, they are evaluated um, up one side and down the other. A lot of times the developers, most times, they hate our comments because you know, we, we hold them to the fire and then they do the preliminary plat that gives them permission at that point to now start grading, you know, start, start putting in infrastructure. Then they come back with a final plat. The final plat allows them to take that next step to start selling the lots, okay, start building the homes. 
Well, before they get that final plat, we're out there looking. Did you put the street drains where you're supposed to? You know, are the pipes in good condition? We make them give us CAD files of all these things so we can review them. We make them camera the pipes, making sure that they are in the condition they're supposed to be in. The outfalls aren't buried in mud through the construction process where we then have to spend our money, spend the city's money on that kind of thing. So it is a very, very time consuming process, both on the front end and throughout the process. Now, you get the rooftops built, you get the driveways in, you got more impervious areas and things like that. Well, that's all in their calculation books that they have to submit as to here's what the, the pre-construction runoff uh, is right now, and when everything's 100% built out, built out, here's what it will be. Hey, so. Let me intervene real quick, Charlie. Um, Sylvia, start the three-minute clock next time he starts talking. But uh, as far as for where we're sitting right Second. now. <laughs> as far as for where we're sitting now, I'm not worried about Dave. He has like four different levels of income between Ralph and all the money the city pays him to be the mayor and retirement. But like for citizens that it's not about a build out or preliminary plats or permits, they're in scenarios that, you know, it is what it is and they have what they have. Is there any avenue for the city to lend a hand or help or come up with a solution versus tough, it's the way it is? And I'm not trying to, mm -hmm. you know, spend thousands of dollars out of the budget. I just didn't know if there's a, a go between a work around something that works with the city working with the citizens that have the water issues. Is there any, anything we could do to help, and I guess. Is. Work, maybe before you respond to that, I'd like to add to that a little bit too. As one of those people that is not like David, as a matter of fact, financially Big baller. or whatever, but, uh, or personally for that matter. But, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, like the stormwater fees, for instance, you were talking about impervious areas, the, 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 the driveways, the roofs, and all that kind of stuff. There are stormwater fees that are now um, uh, applied to uh, homeowners within TKK. And I'm wondering if possibly, as a, as a possible solution, can we use some of that funding that's, that's uh, uh, obtained or accumulated through the stormwater fees to be able to use them, like the city ditch digger or something like that, to, to at least kind of alleviate some of the issues temporarily, maybe? Or something uh, you know that, that that would be at a low cost to the city. That's, that's something I'm throwing out as an idea. The problem, the, the biggest issue, and and I'll use Mr. Mowry, uh, Mr. Mowry's situation as a prime example is, you've got it, it is a it is a private it's on private property. It's there's no city infrastructure. You would be talking about spending public dollars on private property. Okay, now why while, while that may not be an astronomical expense to fix his solution. You've now opened a box to where everybody yeah, now is, him. and now there there is no stormwater money left. Yeah, the the funds that that we collect through that stormwater fee pays for the the brush uh, and leaf collection. You know, the curbside yard debris collection. It it, it pays for um, improving or repairing outfalls, uh, replacing um, old, uh, especially in traditional TKK, the old galvanized steel pipe that's got more holes in it than Swiss cheese. You know, it's, it's fixing and repairing, you know, uh, inlets and curbs and things of that nature. Um, yeah, it, it was never set at a rate to where the city could just go and fix every stormwater problem on or issue on every piece of private property. Yeah, I mean, it, it, based on my recollection of, of the issue on, uh, yeah, down, down on Andover, yeah, it's probably not an astronomical expense, but my concern as your city manager is you would you would be it, it, basically it wouldn't be any different than us going and fixing the roof. You know, you're spending public dollars on on private property, and that's where that's where I see us having the issue, because if we do it for one, we have to be prepared to do it for all. You have four thousand, five thousand homes that we have in the city, it's, uh, and that that's that's where the issue is. Okay, so I respect that, but there are there is a collection of about you know probably a dozen of us on that on the two streets there. So it wouldn't be just one individual residence, obviously. And I wasn't proposing that. I'm not I'm not looking to steal city money by any stretch of the so I appreciate that. So Thanks, Jim. I'd like to just um, add a little bit yes. to that because I have heard from a lot of folks as well, especially in traditional TKK who are dealing with stormwater issues, and it is expensive to fix and it is hard and and. If we can't use city dollars because, like you said, it doesn't really make sense, it's like fixing a roof, is there some way we could um, capitalize on some of the other partnerships that we have, either within the community or um, TKK Forever or something like that, um, in, in 
I don't know, even even providing a grant program where people would apply. I don't know, just trying to think of different opportunities maybe that could be out there or, or other grants that you might be aware of um, that we, we might be able to at least direct them to those folks. I mean, there. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure about, I mean, EPA, obviously, Clean Water Act, I mean, they, there, there are grants that become available, but it's all for um, improving or expanding upon public infrastructure. Um, nine times out of ten, what we run into when we when somebody calls, hey, I've got a huge stormwater issue, my property's flooding, my, house, my garage is flooding, or this, you know, whatever the case may be, Unfortunately, a lot of times we go out there and it's, okay, well, that's, that's a drain that you or the previous homeowner installed. That's not part of the city's infrastructure. That's private infrastructure. Um, yeah, and, and a lot of them don't, you know, more times than not when we explain it, they, they understand it. They don't like it, and I get it. I, would, I, I wouldn't like my yard flooding either. Um, but, again, it, yeah, when, you, when you start talking about grants, whether, and even, yeah, I mean, the city could, set up a grant type system. I mean, lots of cities do, you know, whether it's through their business license program or things like that. Uh, we don't have one in place now. Mm -hmm. um, and I would, I would want us to be very, very specific uh, because obviously, yeah, I mean, obviously you're aware, um, you know, through, through your, your own uh, dealings, not everybody gets the grant that applies, you know, so you got to tell some people no. Mm -hmm. if, we, if we were, if council were interested in setting something like that up, again, we're pretty much spending, I would say, 98% of the stormwater fees collected every year. Um, you know, whether, and, and the bulk of it is spent on drainage maintenance materials. You do have some of your, your, um, your salaries uh, for your maintenance staff that are actually doing that work in there as well. But the very overwhelming majority of it is spent on your drainage maintenance materials to be able to refund or give credits back to folks and things like that. My advice would be that you need to increase that fee then to, to make that available if, if that's what you want, if that's the route council wants to go because we're maximizing every dollar we bring in at this point and it's, you know, we're not able to hit, complete every project every year. Charlie, um, if there was a neighborhood problem, like Jim said, versus an individual problem, would that be indicative of being some kind of a bigger problem than... If there was a neighborhood problem being being generated because of, um, you know, say, say at the top of the neighborhood we had an outfall, you know, coming off a of city street and it was discharging water down through there and that was adding to or creating the issue for the neighborhood, then, yeah, that is absolutely something that we need to take a look at, extend the pipe down, more robust rock apron, you know, do, several different measures. Um, but right now it's my understanding, and I'll be happy to get with, uh, with Mr. Mowry, uh, and, and Tim and look at it on site again. Uh, it's been a few years since uh, I think Tim and I have been out there uh, just to throw another set of eyes at it. But the mm -hmm. last I recall, basically you had it, it's it's the where the Mowrys are is the lowest point of that drainage. Yeah, but I think way. there's other. So you have all those areas. properties. Their okay. surface water is all discharging uh, or flowing down into that one okay, spot. I appreciate that. Yes. Um, but is there any other public comments? Um, okay. I appreciate the, the information, and uh, we'll just see what goes from here. But um, I think we ought to look at it. If there's a neighborhood issue, then it might be something different than an individual. And with that, no more comments. Why don't we go to the city manager's report? Hit the button. All right. <laughs> Start the clock. Three minutes. Real quick. Um, let's see. Last day of school is this Friday. Uh, it's a half day, uh, so just be mindful. Um, we'll have a lot of our uh, smaller pedestrians out and about around the parks and uh, biking home and walking home. So uh, if you're a motorist, just be ready. Summer, uh, summer is here come Friday. Uh, Memorial Day activities. Um, got a lot of great things planned. Uh, the, or the Veterans Association does. 5K run, one mile walk on Sunday. Um, details on that on our website. Um, followed by uh, Sonic Rewind here at the clubhouse uh, after, the, uh, after the race. Uh, Memorial Day ceremony, Living Memorial Gardens, Monday, May 28, 10 a.m. If you've never been, I encourage you to come. It's a gr they do a great job with that. Um, and city offices will be closed on Monday, so tra and trash and recycle will be delayed by one day next week uh, due to Memorial Day. Um, next Wednesday through the end of the week, uh, Katie and I will be out of the office at the city managers, uh, the state city managers conference, um, be available via, um, cell phone, text, email, 
Um, we just won't be in the office. Um, kind of touched on this uh, earlier during Mr. Isley's comments. Catawba Cog uh, is uh, putting together our, um, uh, facilitating our street strategic planning workshop coming up June 9th. Uh, they've already had two focus group meetings, got a lot of good input uh, from, from residents out of that. Uh, they've got a survey out. Take the survey, links on our website. Um, over the weekend, pretty much after uh, the rewind came out, we had over 300 people take the survey. It's all about city services, um, you know, to help, help council as they try to prioritize over the next three to five years. So I encourage everybody to get out and take that. And last but certainly not least, uh, June 16th. Uh, so this will come up before we meet again as, um, with council. Uh, we've got the Big Bamboo Band uh, as our next concert up at Rundy Park. If you missed the last show, you were one of very few that missed it. Uh, unfortunately, I was out of town. I did miss it, but uh, saw the drone video. Holy cow. We had um, about 2,000-plus people at it. It was our biggest attended concert. Fantastic. Word of caution, uh, and we will have uh, markers and tape out for this. Uh, if you're driving up to the show, you cannot park in the median on the inbound side of Rundy all the way to Marquesas. There are no parking signs there. A lot of people park directly up against the no parking signs. Nobody got ticketed, but it definitely caused traffic issues. Um, so we'll, we'll have that roped off. Now on the outbound side, we encourage you to park in the median, not in people's front yards. So inbound, park on the right side. Outbound, park on the left side if you're parking up on, on windward. Uh, so there are public safety vehicles and general traffic can get through there. Uh, if you don't want to deal with that, park at Turner, ride the trolley. It'll be running all night. So. I uh, look forward to seeing everybody on June 16th uh, for that concert. Council, that's all I have on my report. Thank you, Charlie. And I'd also like to mention uh, <laughs> right outside of uh, Rennie Field there, the sidewalks. People are parking on the sidewalks. That's also a big no-no. Don't park on the sidewalks. We try to walk down there. Okay, now we go to council comments. We'll start with Ryan Richard. Um, first off, I think tonight, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the first 5-0 vote. In, a pop, in opposition? In opposition of residential growth. So, uh you know, get the message. If you're not common, coming to the city and proposing, you know, just more business commercial type growth, I don't think, and I can't speak for the rest of the council, but I don't think we're real interested. Um, you know, we heard the message loud and clear from the citizens of the city, and we're here to serve you guys. So we're going to continue to do that, whether it hurts feelings or not. You know, it is what it is. So uh, in addition to that, congrats to the man behind the curtain, Tim, for 30 years of service to the city. That's unbelievable. And last but not least, um, kudos to staff and the chief. I think the face-to-face -face interaction that's coming with the new police station, you know, we, we had tons of complaints about that over the years. You can't walk into the police station and talk to somebody. You know, you think of the horror movie, I'm about to get saved from the mass murderer. You walk in and there's nobody there. You're just <laughs> trapped in. So uh, having, having interaction, with, with, with staff and police officers at the new police station 24 seven, I think is a huge asset to the city and you know, just bodes well for the identity and the, the character of our, our boys in blue here in the city. So we thank you guys for that. And uh, that's it, I'll shut up. Thank you, Alicia. Awesome. Uh, so I just want to talk about the police station a little bit as well. I wanna thank you, um, Charlie and Chief and, and those with, with the design of it. Um, it being the first thing that most people will see coming in on the peninsula, I do think it's really important that it's a building that really, you know, sets a tone for our community and um, not only says we're, we're, we're safe, we're, we're protected, here's our police force, but um, it also says that, you know, we're, we're unique and we care about um, our community and we want to be a partner and so I think that you know the the front porch feel and the, you know the landscaping around the front really is important in um, helping ensure that as you arrive into our city you you feel that um, I also want to just um, tell staff or tell I guess staff and City Council Mayor and City Council that I'm really looking forward to our strategic planning session uh, coming up here in a couple weeks. I, I look forward to all that we'll accomplish there. I think even in our conversations tonight, there's some things that we could maybe even explore um, further in terms of what, what, it, what kind of city do we wanna be in the future? Uh, what are our priorities and what are we gonna do or how are we going to position ourselves to meet those? So um, that's it, thanks so much. Mr. Gus Machinas. When you're last or <clears throat> towards the last, I just want to say that I'm I'm really excited about the police station. Um, you know, 
our first responders need to be able to go to work every day in the facility that they're proud to go into. And I know it hasn't been that way for a while. So I'm really excited about that. And also that fourth, uh, that fourth field. I mean, that Catawba Park is going to be a, just an amazing facility, but that fourth field, I don't think people understand how big a difference that's going to make. And it's going to make a big difference for revenue for us being allowed to have tournaments and this, that, and the other. So I'm just, I'm really excited to be a part of that as well. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Um, I just want to, when you go forth, everybody really steals your thunder. So I'm, I'm just going to sound repetitive here. Yeah. <laughs> um, but again, I, I'm also really looking forward to the strategic planning session on June 9th. So it, um, to reiterate, if you haven't already taken the opportunity to take the survey online, please do that because your input is very important to us. And we want to make sure that we take your voice um, and into consideration when we're making our decisions and moving the city forward for the next several years. Um, Thank you to Sylvia for all that you do. Have a great week celebrating you. <laughs> and uh, congrats to Tim for his 30 years. That's all. Tim's hard at work back there. I would say congratulations to Tim and Sylvia. You guys have earned it. Take Sunday and Monday off. Okay, I know. <laughs> uh, um, and I, too, I can't tell you how excited I am about the Catawba Park and the police station. I think it's going to be a great effort for the city. Um, it's going to be, a, it's gonna be a, still is a great place. It's going to be even greater. And if you're uh, not doing anything, remember what more Memorial Day is all about. Besides, you can come up to the park and see four really handsome veterans doing their thing up there. And uh, it's, really a great, it's really a great ceremony, and the uh, city of TK does it really good. Um, and that's all I have. And with that, I will uh, listen to a motion for adjournment. Mr. Nobody Mayor. wants to adjourn. We'll just <laughs> stay here on. Mr. Mayor, members of council, motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. It's aye. always unanimous. We're adjourned.